Island of the Blue Dolphins, Chapter 23 The hunters left many wounded otter behind them. Some floated in and died on the shore, and others I killed with my spear, since they were suffering and could not live. But I found a young otter that was not badly hurt. It lay in a bed of kelp, and I would have paddled by if Rontu had not barked. A strand of kelp was wound around its body, and I thought it was sleeping, for often, before they go to sleep, they anchor themselves in this way to keep from drifting off. Then I saw there was a deep gash across its back. The otter did not try to swim away as I drew near and reached over the side of the canoe. They have large eyes, especially when they are young, but this one's were so large from fear and pain that I could see my reflection in them. And when you're seeing your reflection, it's like looking in a mirror. I cut the kelp that held it and took it to a tide pool behind the reef, which was sheltered from the waves. The day was calm after the storm and I caught two fish along the reef. I was careful to keep them alive because Otter will not eat anything that is dead and left them in the pool. This was early in the morning. That afternoon I went back to the pool. The fish had disappeared and the young otter was asleep, floating on its back. I did not try to treat its wound with herbs because salt water heals and the herbs would have washed off anyway. I brought two fish every day and left them in the pool. The otter would not eat while I was watching. Then I brought four fish and these also disappeared and finally six, which seemed to be the right number. I brought them whether the day was calm or stormy. The otter grew when its wound began to heal, but still it stayed in the pool. And now when I came, it would be waiting for me and would take the fish from my hand. The pool was not big and it could easily have gotten out and away into the sea. Yet it stayed there and slept or waited for me to come with food. The young otter now was the length of my arm and very glossy. It had a long nose that came to a point and many whiskers on each side and the largest eyes I've ever seen. They would watch me all the time I was at the pool, following me, whatever I did, and when I said something, they would move around in a very funny way. In a way, too, that made pain come to my throat, because they were gay and sad also. So what she's saying is that these eyes were happy, but sad at the same time. I want you to take a moment to reflect. Have you ever felt happy and sad at the same time or noticed when somebody else has felt happy or sad at the same time? And think about why might this otter be feeling happy and why might this otter be feeling sad? For a long time, I called it otter as I had called Rontu dog. Then I decided to give the otter a name. The name was Manani, which meant little boy with large eyes. It was a hard task catching fish every day, especially if the wind was blowing and the waves were high. Once when I could catch only two and drop them into the pool, Monini ate them quickly and waited for more. When he found that was all I had, he swam around in circles, looking at me reproachfully. Reproachfully is, is like blamingly, like why don't you have more? Where's the rest of the fish? Almost angry. The waves were so high the next day that I could not fish on the reef even at low tide, and since I had nothing to give him, I did not go to the pool. It was three days before I could catch fish, and when I went there again, the pool was deserted. That means nobody was there. I knew that he would leave some day, but I felt bad that he had gone back to the sea and that I would never catch fish for him again, nor would I know him if I saw him again in the kelp. For now that he had grown and his wound had healed, he looked like all the others. I know on the previous page or the previous two pages it talked about the word wound, but this is a wound. It's just an injury. Soon after the Aleuts had left, I moved back to the headland. Nothing had been harmed except the fence, which I mended, and in a few days the house was the same as before. The only thing that worried me was that all the abalones I had gathered in the summer were gone. I would need to live from day to day on what I could catch, trying to get enough on the days when I could fish to last through the times when I could not. Through the first part of the winter, before Monani swam away, this was sometimes hard to do. Afterwards, it was not so hard, and Rontu and I always had enough to eat. 
while the Aleuts were on the island, I had no chance to catch little smelts and dry them. These were the fish that she would catch and dry, and then she would light them on fire and their oil would burn and it would give her light at night. So the nights that winter were dark and I went to bed early and worked only during the day. But still I made another string for my fishing spear, many hooks of abalone shell, and last of all, earrings to match the necklace Tutok had given me. These took a long time, for I searched the beach many mornings when the tide was out, before I found two pebbles of the same color as the stones in the necklace, and soft enough to cut. The holes in the earrings took even more time, for the stones were hard to hold, but when I was done and had rubbed them bright in fine sand and water, and fastened them with bone hooks to fit my ears, they were very pretty. On sunny days I would wear them with my cormorant dress and the necklace, and walk along the cliff with Ron too. I often thought of Tutok, but on these days especially I would look off into the north and wish that she were here to see me. I could hear her talking in her strange language, and I would make up things to say to her, and things for her to say to me.